Hi, this is Julie Lubinsky. I am web manager for the Christopher and Dana Reed Foundation. I'd like to welcome everybody to our monthly chat with Nurse, L Nurse Linda right before the new year. Um, thank you all for joining us. I really appreciate um, you all um, logging on for today's call. And I just wanted to tell you a little bit about Nurse Linda. She's been a leader and a provider of rehabilitation nursing for over 30 years and a friend of the Christopher and Dana Reed Foundation for close to 20. And she is also the moderator in our Ask a Nurse discussion in our online community where she focuses on contributing functional advice, providing the how-to on integrating various healthcare improvements into the daily life, and also answering your questions. So we've taken that part of the online community and we brought her into our monthly webinar so you can all hear her lovely voice and ask her questions live. So now I will turn it over to Linda because the hour goes very fast um, and I just want to remind everybody that you can, if you're dialed in, um, star 1 to, to ask a question and you please use the chat feature on the web part as well. Hi Linda. Uh, hi, Julie, and hello, everyone. Good afternoon. It's very nice to be with you today. We're here um, having some wild weather, I think, all around the world. We're hearing mostly, I'm in the United States, so that's what I hear most about our weather is here in the United States. But I know we've had some difficulties all around the world. And I thought that would be a good opportunity just to briefly talk about some uh, safety measures uh, because when we have bad weather like this, there are people who always kind of get caught and stuck in the middle of that. We are having a lot of flooding where I am. It's um, an unusual amount of floody, flooding, and cities are being evacuated. Roads are closed. It's, it's kind of surprising when you think about 2015 and we have all this water and other parts of the country have no water. So it's an interesting phenomenon, yet here we are. Um, sometimes, though, I, I really want to um, say hello to our friends that are in the Dallas area also who've had tornadoes have hit their homes and so they're without homes. But it's a good time uh, for all of us to think about emergency uh, measures during bad weather. We're oftentimes not anticipating bad weather. Living in the Midwest, we have a significant amount of tornadoes that come through, we might have an alert that it might be, um, the weather might be right for a tornado, but we don't know it's coming until it's hit our homes. And, and so we have a lot of people who have lost homes throughout the years, which is, is a good reminder for the uh, people who are in the tornado areas, people who are in the flooding areas, sometimes you have to evacuate very quickly. It's always a great idea to, before there's any kind of trouble, to alert your emergency uh, paramedic at the fire station um, that you have a person or if you are a person that uses any kind of electronic devices or anything that requires electricity for your safety, uh, mobility, and your function because if the power goes out, you're not going to be able to charge your devices, which is a huge problem. So I know for these people who've lost their homes and a lot of people are being relocated to disaster centers where there's a lot of, you know, there's food, there's warmth, there's shelter, but there's also cots to sleep on, which might not be the thing that you would be able to use. Or if you're requiring on mechanical ventilation for breathing, be sure and let your fire department, they're the ones who run the EMS, be sure and let them know that you are a person who requires electricity to survive. And so if they know that, they will come and be sure and um, get, uh, restore the power to your home or uh, provide emergency generators or work with the Red Cross or the Salvation Army, the people who come to help um, organize that you have the equipment that you need. If you are requiring a power chair, you need to be able to plug that in for your mobility. You might require power for your uh, surface uh, pressure reduction mattress or certainly for your ventilator so they would be able to rescue you um, more quickly if they know that you are in that situation. Um, I have done that personally 
and um, with family members, and they, you know, people are, are they're very in tune to that, so they're really um, wanting to help you. That you know, they're in a helping profession, and they want to come and help you and make things uh, as easy for you as possible. A second thing to think about is if you would need to evacuate your home, where would you be able to go where you could get proper care? So sometimes um, you might need to go to the hospital where they might be able to provide um, the type of equipment that you need or help that you might need or a long-term care facility where they would be able to provide the equipment, not that you would become a permanent resident there or not that you would stay there for a long time, but just that you would have access to the kinds of things that you would need, so, you know, a roll-in shower or toileting equipment or uh, surfaces, pre uh, pressure reduction surfaces, that sort of thing. So um, just think about what you would do if, if suddenly disaster hit. It's better to think about it before it comes than after it is upon you. Um, so we have some questions already that um, people have written written in the little chat box there. So let's just start down with those and then we'll get to the blogs um, if we have time. So the first question is about a person who has MS. And MS, I would, um, I'm sure that our reader that's um, writing in the question knows and has studied up on MS, but let's just say a couple of words about it um, for people who might be looking or listening. Uh, to this webinar later. So MS is multiple sclerosis, and it is a, a disease that is thought to be uh, an auto, what we call an autoimmune disease. So for some reason, the body reprograms itself and kind of attacks itself. What happens in multiple sclerosis is that um, your nerves are, are nerve fibers, that each nerve fiber has an insulation called myelin that's wrapped around the nerve fiber. And for some reason in multiple sclerosis, the body attacks that myelin. So if you think about the um, message going down the nerve fiber from your brain to your body, or from your body going back up to your brain, it, has, it, goes, it travels up and down this nerve fiber, and it has this myelin around that holds the message within the nerve fiber. So when the myelin gets dissolved in the multiple sclerosis, that message tends to not be able to travel up and down the nerve fiber itself, so it, it will shoot off to um, maybe to other nerves, or it might just shoot off you know, into the body somewhere. So that's why it's called multiple, multiple sclerosis because there are multiple areas where the nerve fiber has become sclerotic, and that's why it's called multiple sclerosis. And so um, this person has had this for a number of years. Now, what a lot of people don't think about in multiple sclerosis is that you can have these uh, sclerotic areas, these uh, areas of lack of myelin in the nerve fibers in the brain, but you can also have them in the spinal cord. And when you have um, multiple sclerosis in the spinal cord, um, that's where most of your functional deficits will um, result due to the spinal cord um, issue because those messages have to travel up and down the, the spinal cord itself. So um, this person has had uh, multiple sclerosis for a number of years. And if you see two people and they both have multiple sclerosis, um, they might not have the same symptoms because it depends on which nerve fibers have been attacked. So you could have two people with multiple sclerosis, but they could have completely different presentations of their disease. Now, in uh, spinal cord injury itself, when we have a traumatic injury, what happens is that you will lose myelin right at that point of the injury, and it's just at that point. Multiple sclerosis can occur anywhere within the nervous system itself, so you can have problems um, anywhere within the body due to um, the MS. So it's a little bit different, but there are several um, what we call metabolic diseases, such as MS, Guillain-Barre, uh, Friedrich's ataxia. There are several um, diseases that cause um, problems with conducting messages in the spinal cord. So they are considered spinal cord diseases. 
So this poor person has had MS for 20 years. It's a progressive disease, and she now has um, um, quadriplegia. So she's um, having some problems with her bowel and bladder. And as many people who have spinal cord injury, she's kind of fed up with the process that she's um, using for her bowel movements. And so she, the, uh, her sister's looking for, is there anything different that they can do? Well, you know, um, in uh, bowel movements with people who have any kind of spinal cord injury, be it from trauma or from metabolic causes, the main problem is constipation. That's really the focus of the problem. Um, the bowel is still working because it it works through the autonomic nervous system. It might be on a slower pace, but the bowel is still working. And so we have to kind of harness and capture that energy of the bowel to get it to move. It gets sluggish and it gets uh, wants to slow down. So, and after 20 years, it probably is used to being a little bit of a lazy bowel. So how can we get it to go um, to uh, move things, move uh, food waste products along in the system. And one of the key elements uh, for any uh, bowel program is to have adequate hydration, so plenty of fluids to keep things moist in the bowels. And then um, the other key um, issue uh, for the bowel is movement, especially movement in the legs. So if you can provide any kind of range of motion, that will help. It's kind of an interesting thing as even with range of motion, even if it's passive, if somebody's moving your legs for you, um, it can help stimulate the bowel to move. It also um, can help uh, keep the bladder shaken up, so to speak. Um, it always makes me think of James Bond, shaken and not stirred. I don't know why, but it always does. Um, I guess that's just my uh, bladder bowel humor coming through. But anyway, um, so it, that stimulates the bowel to move. It, it keeps the bladder, the urine from pooling in the bladder so there's less infection. So any kind of movement that can be provided, and I say this in particular because it's going to come up with the next question um, that this person has also. So providing any kind of movement will be helpful. There is an automatic reflex in the bowel, and um, it can be stimulated. Um, it's called a gastrocolic reflex. And what that reflex does is when you eat food, and this happens to all of us, when we put food in our mouth and we start to chew, our body senses, hmm, make that saliva, we swallow the food, the stomach starts feeling, uh, filling up with uh, stomach acid. And so this stimulates the bowel to, you know, kind of come to attention. And it gets the little uh, hair follicle fibers in the bowels to start moving the waste product along through the bowel as it starts, um, continues the digestive process. So we like to harness that gastrocolic reflex that you will have no matter what kind of injury you have. It will still be there. And so um, it usually is most effective after breakfast. And so traditionally, most people have uh, do their bowel program after the breakfast meal. And the reason for this is that the bowel's been sleeping along with the rest of the body through the night. So when that food's taken in, that's when the gastrocolic reflex is the strongest because it's just waking up. It's like it's been refreshed from its sleeping. So um, if you can use that particular um, Harness, that's another thing. Warm fluids, um, prune juice, you have to be a little careful um, with your diet and what you're eating. Um, some food will cause you to have a bowel movement too quickly, which leads to incontinence. But looking at adding fiber to the diet, um, then you know the bowel program is as it has been for years and years, which is to um, take advantage of the gastrocolic reflex drink warm fluids. Um, that's why so many people, if they have a spinal cord injury or if they don't, drink their hot coffee in the morning because it's going to stimulate a bowel movement using that gastrocolic reflex. So um, 
this person is using some aids for their bowel movement. Um, usually what people will use is a suppository, a Ducalox, or even a glycerin suppository and um, to stimulate that bowel movement and then digital stimulation, is, which is what they're doing basically. And so you'll want to continue with that, but can you make the bowel program um, uh, less in time, perhaps if you use those different things. What you, if you use those different techniques, what you w do want to avoid is any kind of laxative, because the more laxative that you use, the less bowel, the less your bowel will want to work. So you know, it's like you know, it's that expression: use it or lose it. So if you use uh, oral laxatives, where you take something by mouth to cause you ha have a bowel movement. That can seem rather enticing because sometimes you will have a bowel movement doing that. It will be relatively quick. It can also be highly more uh, incontinent producing, but it also causes the bowel to stop doing its natural function. So that's why we try to avoid that, but we uh, eliminate the stool in the lower uh, bowel through the bowel program. And so the other question is, um, she's using an indwelling catheter for urine remove, uh, elimination, which is something that most women do because of the anatomy. It's hard to do the intermittent catheterization. Now, um, if she's had an indwelling catheter for a long period of time, her sphincter that closes and holds the urine in the bladder might be stretched a little bit because it's constantly being dilated by the catheter. But that can retract if you want to try intermittent catheterization. Um, that allows for the um, filling and emptying of the bladder. It, there's a lot less chance of infection because you don't have that catheter in the bladder at all times. Um, the chance, chances are, after removing the indwelling catheter, um, there will be some leakage and some incontinency because the sphincter has been um, held open with the indwelling catheter. So that is something you would maybe want to talk to your healthcare professional about. Most women use the indwelling catheter because it's just so much more convenient. Um, there are some other things you can use. I would not recommend them at this point if the indwelling catheter is working. If you don't want to go to the intermittent catheter, but there are some things to think about in the future that might be easier. One is the suprapubic catheter, which is an actual surgical procedure where the cat indwelling catheter is kept but through an opening in the abdomen. I don't think that that would be of any advantage to you at this particular point in time. And, but the other one is this Mitrofanoff procedure where there's a little track that's made from the belly button it, through the abdomen, so it's a surgical procedure. Um, usually the appendix is used to create a little track that attaches to the bladder. And so then you don't have to worry about getting in and out of the wheelchair or getting on and off the toilet. It gives you an opportunity to cat through the abdomen, which is a place through the belly button where you can actually physically uh, get to that area as opposed to trying to get to the urethra, which means getting out of the chair, taking an armrest, um, slouching down to try to get to the urethra. It's kind of hidden there, so it's a little more, bit more difficult. Especially if you have some hand function but not a lot of hand function, that is a procedure. But these are surgical procedures, so I don't recommend rushing out and getting them. I just want you to be aware of um, these opportunities that might be available to you for in the future. Now the next question which goes into this is um, talking about a standing frame for people who use wheelchairs to help with their circulation. So I really love standing frames for anybody who uses a wheelchair. And the primary reason for this is um, it's really a psychological reason. Now there's physiological reasons which are keenly important. But for people who use wheelchairs, once they stand in a standing frame, it's a very powerful moment because they get to see themselves upright again. And this is something that really um, has a lot of psychological benefit for people. I see it 
all the time when they, you know, just the idea that they're upright. It's very motivating and it feels very good to people. Um, but physiologically, there's a lot of good reasons. And the primary reason for using a standing frame is that when you're sitting, you're not putting weight through the long bones of your legs. When you don't put weight through the long bones of your legs, that's that big femur bone in your thigh and those legs down in your um, below your knees. So when you're not putting weight between those in all those bones in your pelvis, your lower spine, what happens is the calcium just tends to just drain right out of your bones. You need to have weight on your bones um, to keep the calcium in there. You know, if you have a spinal cord injury or if you don't, uh, people who are overweight have a lot less osteoporosis than people who are not because they have so much more weight going through their long bones. It's kind of a, it's kind of a contradictory kind of thought, but it's the way that it works. So um, the standing frame is excellent for psychological thinking. Um, it is excellent to keep those... Uh, to keep the bones solid because once you get um, osteoporosis in your bones, it's like a, um, looks like a, your bones look, instead of looking solid, they have little tiny microscopic air bubbles in your bones, but you can't see those in bones just, you know, with visualizing with your eyes. But those holes get bigger and bigger and bigger with osteoporosis such that you cannot bear weight on your bones anymore. So that's that's a huge um, issue because it, you tend to have fractures and you know it just leads to all sorts of problems. And if you know if you try to put the fracture back together, if you try to set the bones, they can't set because the bones are like powder in there. So if you try to put a plate in there to connect them surgically. Um, there's no place to connect the plate because the bones are so weak. So there's medications you can take for osteoporosis, but the best thing to do is to get a standing frame, and then your body's natural weight goes through those long bones. And it's usually done for an hour um, a day. You could do it three or four times a week, if you and you just stand in a standing frame. Um, the uh, Anybody can do it because the standing frame has blocks that will keep your knees from bending and keep your hips from bending. And if you have uh, problems holding up your chest, it will help, you know, you can get support for that also. So just about anybody can use a standing frame. In the United States, just about any, um, any insurance will pay for a standing frame. Um, you know, I say that just about any because there's and even um, – Medicare and Medicaid will pay for one, um, but I'm I'm cautious because of course somebody's going to write and say, well they wouldn't pay for mine, and yes that's always a problem because you know Medicaid and insurance is different by your policy etc. But mo for the most part they will pay for those. Now, the reason why I wanted to um, talk about movement and the bowel, and this is where it all ties together, is in standing frames you can get them that you, you do the standing, but they're kind of like um, one of those uh, skiing machines where you can move your arms to make your moves, legs move. Or um, sometimes they'll, they'll have, somebody else can you know, move them so that your legs move. So if you can do that, if you can get a standing frame with that kind of feature on it, um, that helps with moving uh, the legs, which stimulates the bowel, which also keeps the bladder clean. Uh, because you're you know, shaking, not stirring, but you're shaking that urine in the bladder. So standing frames are absolutely wonderful. Now, can you get a cardiac benefit from that? Because this particular question is about does it help with circulation? Well, um, if you are using the arm feature, it can help with circulation. If you're just standing, it's probably not going to do that much with circulation. Now, your heart may beat a little bit faster or a little bit stronger because it's going to be more difficult to pump that blood all through your body. So it's not going to be a problem for your heart, but is it really going to help with circulation? Well, if you have swelling in your legs, if you're just standing, probably not. 
But if you have that reciprocal um, leg moving with your arms moving feature, it will help with some of that circulation because you're basically doing passive range of motion for an hour with your legs. Now you can't get in a standing frame and just start doing this after 20 years. You're going to have to build up to it. It's going to take some time. You're going to have to check the skin because all of a sudden you're going to have uh, opportunity for skin breakdown where you didn't have that before. So as I said, there are blocks that can be put so your knees don't buckle underneath you. Well, now you've got pressure on your knees that you've never had pressure before. So you really have to check your skin, especially when you're starting any kind of new therapy. You're going to have to check places in your skin where you've never had to check before. Um, so thinking about the knees, thinking about the hips, if you have that reciprocal movement, um, your feet are going to be moving in your shoes just ever so slightly, as everyone's does. And so you're going to have to check your feet very carefully. Um, you're going to have to monitor your clothing because what fits us really comfortably when we're sitting might have a waistband that rubs or uh, the pants leg might rub against uh, the catheter tubing. So you're going to have to check and make sure because you're going to be in a whole new uh, world. Hopefully, to get the standing frame, you'll have a therapy session where somebody will show you how to use it and they'll be helping you to check. They'll also be checking your blood pressure because if you haven't uh, stood for a great long time, it's going to be an issue as far as um, being able to stand. Sometimes people pass out when they stand up after a great long time like that. So it might take so a while to build up to it, but you certainly will be able to do all that kind of um, that kind of therapy. So that should be very helpful to you. Um, moving on down our list here, we have a question um, suggesting for severe nerve pain. And that surely is something um, that a lot of people struggle with. Um, for nerve pain, there are only two medications that are available um, uh, for nerve pain. One is uh, uh, Neurontin and the other is Lyrica. Um, now a lot of people will uh, prescribe medication for nerve pain and that are narcotics, but they just dull the sensation of pain in your brain. They don't really affect the nerve endings where the nerve pain is really starting. So when you get on narcotics, you have problems with um, possible addiction. If you're on there for a, a narcotic for a long time, you're probably addicted to the narcotic. Um, and so you really have to be careful to taper off that. But um, the Neurontin and the Lyrica are drugs that are specifically made for severe nerve pain. That's kind of the first level. Now, if you start taking those drugs, you need to build up uh, a blood level of those. It's not like, oh, I have nerve pain. It's not like an aspirin where you, I have nerve pain and I just take some today, but I'm not going to take it tomorrow. You have to take these, pain, these medications on a regular basis to curb the nerve pain. You have to start out on a very, very low dose, and you have to build up over time. And so um, some people have a hard time taking these medications. They'll have swallowing problems or um, some difficulties with getting on these. Those usually resolve after nine days. But that's why we say start out on a very low dose. Now, you can also, um, if those medications don't work out for you, um, there are some other medications that um, oftentimes work. One is um, medications for depression. Now you say, but I don't have depression. I have nerve pain. Well, if you take um, medications for depression, but in a very low dose, so like there's some medications that you can take that for depression you have to take like 150 milligrams. But for nerve pain, one of the side effects of these medications is treatment for nerve pain. So if you take like 10 milligrams of that, it will do nothing to your um, mental status, it will do nothing to your thinking, but it may help your nerve pain. So that you can try some of those medications. Um, then in the um, other things that you might be able to do is um, to get um, 
uh, one of these um, electronic devices that you can wear that that um, doesn't allow the nerve signal to go through. Um, there's some external devices, and then there's some implantable surgical devices. The, fir the line of treatment is to usually start out with an oral medication, and then if that doesn't work out, you can try one of the um, external uh, devices to, to break that pain. Um, there's also the, um, the baclofen pump, uh, Baclofen sometimes helps with the nerve pain because it calms uh, the spast. It's, cal it's a drug for spasticity. If you can calm the spasticity, then sometimes the nerve is not so uh, tightly wound and cramped up. So you can try some baclofen by mouth, but sometimes you need even some people will need an even stronger treatment. And so there's a thing called the baclofen pump, which is actually, it's, it looks like the size of a little heart pacemaker. It's put inside the fat of the abdomen in the front. And then there's a little catheter that uh, is tunneled around to your back. And the little catheter drops baclofen medication in a really strong dose and bathes your spinal column in this baclofen. So um, that uh, helps a lot of people also. Um, baclofen is um, more dense than your cerebral spinal fluid, so it stays in the bottom of your spinal cord and it doesn't go up into your brain. It's, um, when you have one of these pumps, you're taking a much higher dose than you could ever take by pill or by your mouth, and that is because it doesn't have to travel through the whole body. Whenever you take something in your mouth, it's going to travel equally through your whole body. So the baclofen pump, and this person is talking about burning pain in the groin and the legs and feet, so that might be if, you, if the medication, which is the first line of defense, does not work out, then you can try um, maybe the baclofen pump. They will give you a trial of that before they do the surgery just by injecting the baclofen into your spine to see how that works for you. And if you pass that trial, if it really works out, and it's kind of interesting to see people who have a successful trial, they will want that put in, you know, the baclofen pump put in right away because it's the first time they've been pain-free for maybe even years. But, you know, then you have to wait and have the surgery scheduled. So it is quite a process. Um, treating nerve pain is not something where you're like, oh, here's a prescription, and then the person goes home and takes the pill or does the treatment. It just doesn't work like that. It's very much a trial and error process. It's very much working with your healthcare professional and communicating to them when things do work, when is the pain worse, um, you know wh what the response was if you you know if you felt overtired when you took some of the medication or how all this um, um, is working out for you it's very much a, a part of well you know we'll start on the usual dose maybe you'll need more maybe you need less so it's very much working with somebody to really work through this unfortunately it's a horrible pain but it's not the kind of thing where it's you know, there's just a standard treatment for everyone. So it is a lot to work through. But that's basically the, the process and kind of the hierarchy um, that uh, is, is the process for that. So I hope you get some relief in using some of those treatments. Um, back to the MS, um, is, will the new treatment that the 36 are trialing be helpful to MS? Well, you know, now this is just a wonderful question, and I don't know if anyone actually knows the answer, but my mind, and, and this is just from knowing about uh, healthcare and the way things work, I think it definitely will. Now, maybe not this iteration of the trial, but this is my thought about spinal cord injury, and uh, you know, this is why so many people are interested in it, is because when somebody has a traumatic spinal cord injury, it's just like a natural experiment, really. You know exactly um, in trauma, you know exactly where the injury is, you know exactly when it happened, if it was an accident, you know exactly what the outcome uh, of the injury is. 
all these things are pretty predictable because we know about the spine. So if you think about your old high school biology class and people were doing experiment and they talk about control and you have to have experiments with all these controls, well, a spinal traumatic spinal cord injury is almost like a natural experiment because you know exactly what's going on. Now, when you have a metabolic injury, it's a little bit different because... Um, you don't know exactly when the MS started. I mean, we know when we first started seeing symptoms, but did the person have MS and have some of those uh, sclerotic plaques before um, we saw any functional changes? Possibly. It's the same thing like with Parkinson's disease. When did the Parkinson's disease really start? We're not sure. Um, same thing with uh, some of the dementia diseases. When did it really start? We're not really sure. So we don't have those controls. However, what we do know from um, these 36 and what we are finding out more and more, there's no results from that yet that um, we just know from the first trial of that and now they've gone to a bigger group. But what we do know is that what we have found out through this uh, research and through other research is we used to think that if somebody had any kind of spinal cord injury, the only way to put it back together was to match fiber to fiber. Okay, that would be like shaving all the hair off my head and then saying to fix my spinal cord injury, we have to put every hair back on and match it to its original spot. Well, you can imagine. Oh, how's that ever going to happen? Um, but what we know now is that we don't need to do that. We just need to make the connections. And the body, the brain, the spinal cord will send signals. We just need the connection. And so that's what's happening with the 36. So if you think about they've been chosen because they've had traumatic spinal cord injury. Could this helpful, be helpful to MS? Absolutely. Now, exactly how it's going to all work together, I don't have privy to that information, but I can't help but to believe in my heart of hearts and in my brain, there's just no way that this trial with the 36 is not going to help everyone with neurological disease in the spine and eventually in the brain. So will this be the one particular thing that will work? I hope so. Um, we already know that um, people are the first people that had this done have met with, I think, pretty great success. Um, they still need some therapy to help refine their movements and to control their movements. So it's not like right now. It's not like we, you know, you have the the surgery and you have this. Uh, implantation of the FES and then all of a sudden this works but if you look at the history of the progress of how all of this is coming together it's just like this is just so exciting um, these are just exciting times so if you think way back um, years ago in the polio e epidemic um, we have this these people that were doing movement and they would they would set up these therapy sessions where they would move people's limbs for 8, 10, 12 hours a day every day and they would have different um, cycles of people that would come in and just and just do passive range of motion over and over and over again. And guess what? That helped with the treatment of polio. Well, then we advanced a little bit more, and then we got into the electrical stimulation, and then we advanced a little bit more now with this trial. Um, the big idea was the 36. So you see things are just moving, moving through at a lightning pace right now. Now, it's a lightning pace um, looking at it, unless you have a spinal cord injury, and then it's like, oh, well, we're trying another thing. I've been injured for a long time. But this is probably the most exciting time for research right now. So it's, this is just very, you know, will it help MS? I just really, absolutely. I think that they'll be able to uh, transition one treatment from one disease one neurological disease to another. So we just need to figure it out, break the code, and then move forward. So very exciting time. 
Okay, so um, the next question is that we have a person with a T7 incomplete and is feeling some function, and but they've been having some urological um, problems and it uh, feels like a UTI uh, with soreness uh, spasms and discomfort at the urethra. And, um, you know, this, this is the thing. Um, he, so anyway, he's having some difficulty. But this is one of the things with um, incomplete injury is that all of this, um, these issues that you're having, some discomfort, feel like you have a UTI all the time, but the test says negative. Um, so um, he's, he's hopeful to have some sensitivity, yes. Um, so what's happening, in, it's an incomplete injury, so some messages are getting through and some messages are not getting through. So anytime you have messages getting through, that's a huge step forward for you. And this is another one of those kind of oxymoron things about spinal cord injury, especially when you have an incomplete injury. Those messages are getting through, but they're not quite getting through in the right way. And so it's the, the body doesn't know what to do with that message, so it's interpreting it as pain. It's interpreting it as discomfort. So I have to say for you, how wonderful is that? Now, you're probably like, what? But how wonderful is that? Because messages are getting through. I need some way to train those messages and to get those messages um, through so that your brain can interpret them in the right way. So um, the, the more discomfort that you're having, if it keeps getting worse, that's more messages that are breaking their way through your spinal cord injury to find some way to get through to the brain. So, um, um, you know, if you can harness this, if you can find a therapist who can work with you, um, talk to your healthcare professional about harnessing the spasm. Maybe you would be able to um, catheterize or to avoid using your spasm, um, using some of the reflex techniques. Um, since you have all of these things going on, um, this could work out very positively for you. Um, you might need to do something to control, you know, if you have severe pain, but you might be able to harness this um, to your ability. So find somebody who has a good specialist in spinal cord injury. If you're able, to, if you don't have someone in your community that treats people with spinal cord injury a lot, that does a whole practice, a physiatrist who treats spinal cord injury. You need to find somebody who can do that. Um, sometimes you can find a nurse or you can find a therapist in your community that maybe has uh, experience and can show you some of the techniques that you can use to kind of harness some of this um, discomfort that you're having to, to translate that into some functional abilities. Um, there are some reflexes that you might be able to use. There's some different techniques um, that you might be able to use to harness this into a very positive um, outcome for you. Um, prone to uh, bladder and kidney stones, those are little um, Bugaboos um, will an ultrasound help in finding out if you have those? Um, that certainly would be one of the ways to uh, diagnose uh, bladder and kidney stones. You can have just a x-ray of your abdomen. Um, they call it a KUB, and that stands for kidneys, ureter, and bladder. And so that's an x-ray that they take just of the urinary system to see if there are any stones in there. Um, so an x-ray or an ultrasound um, would be able to help you. Now, um, people who have um, problems in their uh, urinary system with stones can be anybody. It's not um, something that is just unique to people with spinal cord injury. But um, you'll want to um, be sure that you're um, trying to keep your fluids up and try to keep your urine as acid as possible. If you are not diabetic, you might want to drink cranberry juice that has a lot of sugar in it, so that might not be uh, working for you in your diet if you're diabetic or if you have a, a high blood sugar. Some people will take um, 
cranberry pills. Um, uh, just try to keep your um, your urine as acid as possible. Now, people think, oh, okay, orange juice, that's a highly acidic drink. But orange juice goes in your mouth as an acid. It comes out as a base. So orange juice will help increase stones, urinary tract infections. Cranberry and apple juice will help um, reduce. It comes out as a, an acid. So keeping yourself well hydrated and uh, keeping your urine acidic will be uh, help, uh, helpful. Um, so what tests should we do on a regular basis to maintain bladder health? The urodynamic test is uh, recommended for people with spinal cord injury um, on a yearly basis. That will test your pressures. Make sure that you're not having too much pressure in your bladder, that the urine isn't shooting up into your ureters, into your kidneys. Those are not storage vessels, so you cannot have urine going up the other way. You need to have them um, have it all coming down. So that, that is the test that is recommended uh, on a yearly basis. Um, so how do people look after their continence needs in the United States? Well, uh, we in the United States, we t uh, tend to mostly recommend intermittent catheterization. That is the, um, the method where the uh, catheter is put into the bladder and then removed at certain intervals. Um, it, you can do it depending on how much fluid you take in or you can do it um, in a, on a timed fashion. <laughs> Pardon me. Um, usually, people get into a routine where they, you know, they have their coffee and their uh, juice at breakfast, and then they calf after a certain amount. Of, you know, well, they calf first thing in the morning because they've laid there all night, and then they'll calf a certain time after breakfast, and then maybe again after lunch. And so people get into a routine after that. So that is um, the most highly recommended um, method for controlling. Uh, urinary continence, and that is um, because it allows the bladder to fill and to uh, work normally to hold the urine. Um, for uh, bowel uh, continence, uh, people generally do the bowel program every other day. It's um, most often it's done in the morning time because of, as I said earlier, those reflexes, and so that's the time that most people are really um, able to empty their bowels. However, that does not work in everyone's life, so don't feel like you're locked into a morning bowel program. In the United States, most people go to a rehabilitation center. They're put in a, on a bowel schedule based on how convenient it is in the rehabilitation center. So they divide up the patients. These patients, this half gets morning bowel programs and this half gets afternoon bowel programs because there's a limited number of staff that um, can do these procedures. Another thing is to think about gravity. And um, if you can do any bowel, calf, uh, bowel program or bladder cathing, even women, if you can catheterize on the toilet or on a commode chair so that the person is sitting up, gravity plays a huge factor in um, elimination, whether it's a person with spinal cord injury or without. So in the U.S., because of time constraints, again, in the rehab hospital, a lot of times people are catheterized or have their bowel program in bed, which is not very functional. When I come to work, I don't have a bed to lay down and do all these things in. I, I don't have a spinal cord injury, but you know, no one does. So you know, if you can if you can accommodate these things on the toilet for women, um, we'll you know we'll, we'll teach them to catheterize if they're able to do it themselves by floating a mirror in the toilet so they can see. Um, their anatomy, and um, but gravity is the key key thing there. So um, let's see what else do we have here. Um, oh, aloha, somebody from Hawaii. I don't know how nice. Um, I would like to be in Hawaii right now <laughs> and get rid of get away from some of this flooding. Um, okay, so um, they're visiting a family in Kentucky. Um, so how nice! Um, welcome. I hope you have a wonderful trip. Um, he has a more involved question about a spinal cord injury C three. 
uh, cervical level uh, 3 Asia D and would like to email you, please go right ahead. Um, you can go to the blog and there's an email for me there and I would be happy to answer that. Um, for you at any time. I, um, my time to answer is on Wednesday evenings, but I usually, I, and I'm available on Wednesday evenings. However, um, anytime you want to email me, I answer as soon as the emails come in. So I'm not really, I don't feel really locked down to that. So anytime anybody wants to email, is, you know, if you don't want to ask on the um, chat line, that's perfectly fine. And so I would be happy to do that. Um, uh, so, oh, so somebody uh, here is having nerve pain in the shoulder blade area and spasms. So he takes a low level of baclofen. Um, would a higher level um, uh, help? Well, you know, baclofen is an interesting drug. It's a drug that you can become tolerant to. And so if you've been taking 5 milligrams of baclofen in the morning and in the evening, and now you're having that uh, spasticity is kind of feeling like it's getting stronger or it's not working like it used to, it's because it probably isn't. Because maybe you've built up a tolerance, and maybe if you've just started the baclofen and you feel like you're getting some relief but not a lot, you might need to tweak it up a little bit. So be sure and talk to your um, physician and find out. Uh, five milligram is a little tiny dose, and unless you're a very small person or a geriatric aged person, um, people. Um, Baclofen is given by dosage, not by weight calculation. But if you're a very, very small person, 5 milligrams could be a very big dose for you. If you're a larger person or an average sized person, it's a very small dose. So that's 10 milligrams a day. So um, I would certainly check with the doctor and see, especially if you've gotten a little bit of relief from the baclofen, especially in the spasticity, that's going to help you a lot, I think. Um, so we've certainly had a lot of questions today. It's been a wonderful um, opportunity. Um, please think about um, what you might be wanting to do in the new year. My last blog that I po uh, posted was about opportunities for health. And so there are three things that are going to be um, very important for people with paralysis um, to think about in the new year. And um, uh, one of the things is um, to breathe. Breathe deeply. Keep those lungs clean. Breathe in, um, and you know, if you you know every time you um, I don't know watch uh, change programs on TV or before lunch or even uh, if you have some swallowing difficulties after you eat you can breathe deeply and exhale clear that food out of the back of your throat and um, if you smoke anything stop smoking I know there's a lot of um, news items about and advertisements about the e-cigarettes e are safer uh, than regular cigarettes. Uh, no, they're not. You're still breathing all kinds of products into your lungs. So if you, if you smoke anything, stop. Um, do some regular breathing to help if you are on a ventilator. Use the side button on periodic times as prescribed. Um, so that you keep your lungs really clear. It's important to all of us if you uh, have paralysis or if you don't have paralysis. Um, the other thing is to move, perform your skin checks, move your body at least twice a day. The parts that don't move, have someone move them for you or move them yourself. Do your pressure releases. Remember, if you're sitting on a pressure reducing um, cushion, um, that will help, but that is not going to uh, eliminate you from pressure ulcers. And we certainly don't want that to happen. So turn yourself at night. Do your pressure releases. Again, find some uh, way whenever the television has a commercial on, do a pressure release. Um, I sit in an office next to a person that has a very busy telephone. I shift my uh, uh, body around whenever I hear that telephone ring, just to just to have some stretch time. 
it will help you with um, uh, it will help you keep your body soft and pliable, reduce your spasticity. And the third thing is to drink fluid and eat well. If you don't have a cardiac condition, um, try to increase your fluid over time. It will help your bowel and bladder. Moving will help your bowel and bladder. So, um, Jenny, I appreciate your comments and your questions in particular because that played right into my goals for the new year. So thank you. I see that there's some people that are talking about the baclofen. Um, yeah, 5 milligrams is a small amount. If it works for you, hey, stop there. That's all you need. But um, somebody else has written in that they have uh, 30 milligrams of baclofen daily. The dose, um, I've seen some patients on extremely high doses. So hopefully you won't have to go that high, but you know, if a five is doing, taking the edge off, but maybe 10 will do a little bit better, go ahead and do that. And then um, um, on the email, um, just be sure and, um, oh, now we're having a look a little competition on the number of milligrams people are taking. See, everybody has a little bit different because it's a trial and error kind of thing. So that is definitely um, something that um, is unique to you and whatever it is will be your um, answer to your particular case. There's no one answer to any anybody's nerve pain. So um, if there's nothing else for the day, I think that takes, concludes us for our hour. This has been a rousing um, webinar, and I thank you all for attending. Uh, is there anything else you have, Julie? No. I am good for today, and I just want to encourage everybody to contact Nurse Linda by leaving a message on our online community, and she can reach out to you from there because um, it will probably go through our information specialist um, so that um, the messages can get um, properly sent to get to Nurse, Nurse Linda and also our information specialists are um, live people as well and they have a ton of resources to give you as well. So you can find all that information on paralysis.org. Um, so thank you everybody for joining us today. Your questions were fantastic. I have learned so much today, especially right before the um, new year. I'm looking forward to going into the new year. And your next webinar will be the end of January. So thank you, Nurse Linda. I appreciate it. And ha everybody have a happy new year. Thank you, Julie. Bye. Bye. Ladies and gentlemen, that does conclude the webinar call for today. We thank you for your participation and ask that you please disconnect your line.